Hello, this is Ellie Gettinger uh, for your Jewish Museum Milwaukee Museum moment. Um, today, we are wrapping up our story about Golda Meir and uh, giving a little bit of a kind of closing to her story. What I will say is that this is never um, as much of the story as we can tell, there's always more to do. So maybe down the line, I'll do more on Golda as prime minister herself, because today we're it's going to take a lot of our energy to get to that point. Um, I want to give another shout out to uh, Dan Lee and the team at Milwaukee Public Libraries, uh, public history uh, that the humanities department, because really today, as I was putting this together, they opened up a few new questions for me, which is always so exciting when I can get some new information and new insight. I know my docents who will watch this later will be really excited about those pieces. So when we last left off, uh, Golda had fought her parents, run away to Denver, come back, gone to school uh, in Milwaukee and enrolled herself in Milwaukee Normal School. Um, and there were a couple of pieces in that Denver trip that I left off. One of the important ones is that while she was in Denver, she met a young man named Morris Meyerson. Morris was also an immigrant. Um, he had come to the United States, I believe, with his mother. And he was fond of Golda. They started stepping out. He would take her to theater and to symphonies and to art museums and introduced her to a kind of cultural life that she had never been part of before. And they um, and then after she moved back to Milwaukee, they maintained a correspondence. And in 1917, when she was 19 years old, they got married actually on December 24th. Um, prior to that, she still is super active in all sorts of Jewish activities and especially Zionist activities. And this is where I want to jump into my presentation again. So one of these things is Yiddish Volkschule, where she teaches um, uh, she teaches classes. As I said, she worked at the library, but she's active in an organization called Polet Sion, which is a, uh, a Zionist organization in the labor Zionist kind of feeling. If you look at this picture of Golda here, she is the lady on the end at this Yiddish Volkschule picnic. Clearly these people are not practicing social distancing uh, in 1916. Um, and she continues to work and speak. I found a fabulous article from 1948 from the uh, Milwaukee Journal as sent by Dan Lee. Um, and in that article, it really does describe the story of her father going out and finding her speaking on street corners. And at first he's incensed, you know, he's gonna carry her back by her braids and he comes back totally chastened because she is such a passionate and powerful speaker. Now, this was another piece that was new to me and I love it. Uh, this is a piece uh, that shows when Golda left for Israel in 1921, and this is from the Milwaukee Journal, this is not from the Jewish Chronicle, that someone had thought it newsworthy enough that Mrs. Goldie Meyerson was leaving for Israel that it should be in the newspaper. It's on page 15 and you can see it says, Mrs. Goldie Meyerson, prominent Milwaukee Polite Zionist who is awaiting her passports to Palestine and leaves Milwaukee Monday for New York, was entertained at a farewell party on Saturday night. So it is newsworthy that Golda is going to Palestine, which I think is fascinating that this, this is making news in 1921. She's 23 years old at this point. Um, and she doesn't have children yet. Um, and she immigrates to Palestine with a rather large group. It includes her husband, her sister, the radical Shana, um, her brother, uh, not her brother-in-law, Radical Sam Kormgold stays back to make money for the rest of the family. Um, her two, her niece and her nephew, and her best friend from Milwaukee, a girl named Regina Hamburger, a woman named Regina Hamburger. And they all go together and they all take this rather treacherous journey. She describes it in her memoir that they go from New York to um, 
Italy and I think for to Naples, Italy. And somewhere in that journey, there is a mutiny on the ship and there is no potable water and they get to uh, Naples and then they take another boat to Alexandria and from Alexandria, they then take a train to what is then Yafo, Tel Aviv. And they're living in this very precarious situation where it's, you know, there's not a lot of the settlements are new. There's not a lot of development and, you know, there are all of these new people trying to figure out what to do with themselves. Golda and Morris at first go to a kibbutz and they settle there. And this is one of those things in her memoir. She talks about how much she loves taking care of the chickens and how she adored it. But Morris really never settles in. He is not built for a uh, kind of halutzim life, pioneer life. He uh, is he, one of the things that he's made fun of is because he brought a record player who would bring a, a record player to um, a photograph to Israel at this point, Palestine at this point, it was just shocking. And so they depart from the kibbutz and they end up in Jerusalem, where Golda becomes part of the political force. And interestingly, in this set of articles that um, MPL, the Milwaukee Public Library, sent to me, is that as early as 1929, Golda starts coming back to Milwaukee to speak. Um, and she has all sorts of uh, things that she's speaking about here. Generally, she is speaking to the pioneer women. And um, this piece, this article is from 1935. In the years from 1929 to 1937, she comes seven different times back to Milwaukee. She's raising money. At one point, it says she's raising $60,000 nationally. That would be about $10 million in today's terms. Um, and in this article, it says something that I found to be very interesting, and it really pointed to something else that I already had some insight into. It says here that she is on tour on behalf in the United States on behalf of the labor movement and the Motsait ha, um, Hapoalot, the Women's Council, of which she is the executive director. The council has charge of placing German refugees, and the Milwaukee Council of Jewish Women is among the groups to respond to the work of Motsait Hapoalot. Um, so it's Interesting. Golda is working and raising money on behalf of German refugees in 1935. This is right at the same time as the Nuremberg laws are coming in. It's before Kristallnacht. And she's saying something needs to be done with people who are trying to escape Hitler very early. Now, one piece that I had great insight in before this is Golda is a representative at the Evian Conference. And the Evian Conference was convened by FDR in 1938, in the summer of 1938, in order to explore what should be done about uh, German and Central European refugees fleeing Nazis. Now, Golda is there as a representative of the Jewish Agency, and probably because of her work with German refugees through uh, this organization that we just spoke about. But because she does not represent a country, she isn't allowed to speak. Here is what she says about that conference. Uh, she says, I don't think that anyone who didn't live through it can understand what I felt at Evian, a mixture of sorrow, rage, frustration, and horror. I wanted to get up and scream at them. Don't you know that these so-called numbers are human beings? People who may spend the rest of their lives in concentration camps or wandering around the world like lepers if you don't let them in? Of course, I didn't know then that not concentration camps, but death camps awaited refugees who no one wanted. At the outcome of the Evian conference, is that no country except for the Dominican Republic is willing to take in Jewish refugees. Um, and some of them make these very explicitly or implicitly anti-Semitic kind of statements. Uh, there's some Central European countries that talk about how they don't want intellectuals, um, which is kind of coded for Jews. Australia says they don't want to import a racial problem. And you know, all of these countries basically stand by. The Dominican Republic really is looking for a PR save because the year before there had been a massacre, the Dominican Republic, the Dominican government had massacred a group of people along the Haitian border. And the other thought was that maybe if these white European Jewish immigrants come in, maybe they could help lighten the population. So the one country that brings in Jewish refugees is doing it for horrible reasons. And Golda is in the middle of this. 
before Israel becomes a state, there is a point in which she is actually the de facto leader because all of the rest of the leadership of Israel is um, of pre-state Israel are incarcerated. So there's a moment that she is actually in charge before the country becomes a country. And then when Israel becomes a country, she is the she is one of the signatories of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. Her first appointment in the Israeli government is that she is the ambassador to the Soviet Union. And there is this fabulous picture of her as the ambassador to the Soviet Union in 1940. Um, I believe it's 1948. And there are 50,000 people who greet her there. Uh, this is that picture. And you can see her in the middle of the circle in this crush of humanity of people coming from all corners. And this is, you know, Rosh Hashanah, 1948. Just think about how close, how many of these people probably had some sort of experience during the Holocaust, even, the, you know, that they were, maybe they were had family members in villages that were destroyed. Maybe they were in the Soviet army, you know, so many of these people and they're all there just to get, you know, a word from to get close to the uh, ambassador to Israel. Um, she actually had the first passport that was issued by Israel uh, because of her foreign service work. And it's at this time she changes her name from Meir to from Meyerson to Meir. Meir means to illuminate. According to legend, David Ben Gurion picked this name for her because he liked the kind of uh, pun of Golda to illuminate. She continues to travel back and forth to Milwaukee. Uh, and her last visit to Milwaukee is in 1969 when she is prime minister. And this is a huge crowd that has gathered at the airport. Um, you can see in this picture here uh, that Mayor Meyer is there. Uh, the gentleman on the far uh, left is Ollie Edelman. Mel Zaret is there. And actually the guy whose face is obscure that is Yitzhak Rabin, he's her security detail. And she does a press conference and she goes and she does a huge uh, kind of tour of Milwaukee, a kind of small local girl comes back, does good. Um, this is when she's prime minister. She's prime minister from 1969 to 1973. And this is a picture that was taken at Fourth Street School. The school that she had gone to, a group of students greeted her. She had an assembly. They talked about her grades. And uh, one of the things that then happens after her death is the school changes its name to honor her in 1979. Golda Meir School is one of my favorite schools to work with. I generally get the privilege of working with them about once a year. And one of the things that I love the most is that they have really taken the legacy of their namesake seriously. So the, these students understand who Golda Meir is, and, um, and, and they do a great job of talking about her and her story. So I will say she's complicated. I didn't get into some of those complications. Maybe that's for another day. Um, and especially one of the things that's really complicated about her legacy is the fact that in America, and especially amongst American Jewish women, she is beloved. In Israel, she has a little bit more of a complicated legacy, especially because of the 1973 Yom Kippur War, um, which was seen as her responsibility, her fault. Um, and this is an interesting issue to get into, just how leaders are seen in different ways around the world. It's certainly something that we continue to grapple with. And that perception is real. This is going to end our week on Golda. It has been so much fun to share her with you. Next week, we are celebrating the museum's birthday. And it is actually our 12th anniversary. So we're going to start out on Tuesday by looking at the idea of bat mitzvah. Because this is our bat mitzvah year. Um, and so we hope you can join us. We will be here at 2 o'clock on, and by we, I mean I, will be here at 2 o'clock on uh, Tuesday. And if you've loved our programming, please feel free to drop by our website, jewishmuseummilwaukee.org, and make a donation. Thanks very much. Have a great weekend, and Shabbat Shalom.